I don't know about you all, but I need Christmas to be a beacon of hope more than ever this year. I, I feel like every day with my kids, with my wife, uh, we're just counting down, like, if we can just get to Christmas, if we can just get to Christmas, because we know that there's something bright and joyous waiting for us. And I'm personally so encouraged to reflect and remember that for us, this isn't just an empty symbol. This isn't just somebody made up something as an excuse to, to celebrate or try and have some joy in the midst of a bleak winter. But that Christmas for us is based on a promise come true. And not just one promise, but many promises that were fulfilled in the form of a baby in a manger 2,000 years ago. So I'm especially excited for this series, and I hope you are too. And if you've been with us the last couple of weeks, you've seen a few of these unbreakable promises that we're talking about that were made in Jesus and that we celebrate here at Christmas. Because if these promises could be true then, they can be true and encouraging for us now. So if you were here a couple of weeks ago, you probably saw some of these first ones. So the first, these promises are what the Messiah would look like. Um, and, and before we get that, uh, I'm gonna just talk about Malachi 3 real quick, uh, which says this, it's one of these promises, again, these predictions, and God says, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. And then suddenly the Lord that you are seeking will come to his temple. This Messiah will be here and he will be the messenger of the covenant uh, and whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. And so this is, again, one of more of these promises, and these are the promises that we've been looking at all through the series. And so it says that this, this messenger, this Messiah, this anointed one of the Lord will come. And so two weeks ago, we saw that that person would come as a light to the world. The world's filled with darkness. This, this promise is that he will bring light to the world. Or if you hear here last week, this Messiah will come as a ruler, one who will upend the structures and authorities of this earth. And if you've paid attention to the Christmas story at all in previous years, you've heard maybe some other common promises about Messiah, that, that he'll be a rescuer uh, from people who are in trouble. Or that he'll even be, this is maybe a little odd, but a sacrificial lamb. Like he'll be the one who will pay the price for us. But today, we're gonna to be looking at a promise that feels a little different than some of these promises you see today. This promise is, again, from Malachi chapter three. So this is what Malachi three, how he describes this promised Messiah. He says, when that Messiah comes, who can endure that day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be not a rescuer, not a light, not a sacrificial lamb, he will be a refiner's fire, or a launderer's soap. And he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. And then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem, God's people, will be acceptable to the Lord as in the days gone by, as in former years. Right, so this is a new, different, different aspect on this Messiah, so let's kinda of go back to that list. So in light of all these things, he's gonna come as a purifier. This refiner's fire, this launderer's soap, Jesus is going to, or this promised Messiah is going to clean up something, he's gonna purify something. It's an odd word, an odd thing, so we wanna look carefully at what Malachi meant by that and, and what promise uh, of hope we can find through that. See, he, he continues in this prophecy in verse five. He says, look, so this is what it's gonna look like. The, ref the refiner, the purifier will come to put you on trial. And I'll be quick to testify against the sorcerers, the adulterers, and the perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, those who oppress the widows and the fatherless, and deprive the foreigners among you of justice. But do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. This is the picture of the purifier that Malachi paints. Now let me give you a little bit of context for, for when and when, where he's speaking. Uh, again, if you've been following the last few weeks, you've maybe heard a little bit of the history of God's people. You see, they had a mighty kingdom and then through their own troubles and sin, uh, they rejected some of God's uh, rules and law and promises and, and were, were conquered. 
And so it's in the midst of that conquering and they're feeling the darkness of that that God promises to be a light. And then last week, as they're living in exile or in, and just freshly back from it, and they're, they're really wrestling with the whole governmental thing and, and, and what does authority look like and what do kings and victory look like, God promises, no, I've got a different ruler for you. And now here today with Malachi, we're, we're a few years in to the restoration of God's people to their country. They, they've come back from being conquered. They've come back from exile. And now they're rebuilding their society. And Malachi's looking around and, and he's noticing a problem. And, and the problem was this, that, that for 70 years while they were in exile, they kept saying, this is really bad. This is really terrible. Life's awful right now. But if we can just get through this season, if we can just get through exile, we'll get back home. Everything will be good again. And I, I can definitely relate to that. That's definitely how, how I feel with all of the coronavirus stuff going on. Is, oh, if, we, if we can just get through this, we'll get back to normal again. And that's how the Israelites were. If we can just get through the exile, get back home, everything will be good again. And so they've gotten through it. They're back home now. And Malachi looks around and things aren't better. Life isn't good. The blessings of the Lord are not pouring out the way that they had anticipated. And so he's now in his own despair, he's prophesying and saying, all right, here's what the problem is. We thought the problem was, was maybe the Babylonians. We thought the problem was all the evil and the sin and the junk out there. But it turns out our very own leaders are corrupt and wicked too. It turns out that, that the very body of believers, the, the, the faithful, righteous people themselves have problems within that haven't actually been fixed, that need to be purified. And we, we lost so much time and so much energy thinking that, that all the problems were external, but really the problems were internal to our community. There's something about our community of faith that needs to be fixed, needs to be changed. And when this Messiah comes, yes, he's gonna be a ruler. Yes, he's gonna be a light in the darkness. He's also going to be a purifier because we need purifying from within. See, Malachi's saying, you might not realize it, but this purifier, this, this Messiah, he's coming to purify. He, he's coming to town and he sees everything you're doing. He knows if you've been good. He knows if you've been bad. He's even got this list. He maybe even checks it more than once. And Guys, you realize Malachi is predicting Santa Claus? <laughs> like, that's what he's doing, right? He's saying there's this guy and, and he's gonna come and he's gonna, he, he knows who the bad people are and he knows who the good people are and he's gonna separate them out, he's gonna purify. Malachi is predicting the naughty and nice list. That's what he's doing. And in fact, you can map it really clearly. Like, let's look at a, at a typical naughty and nice list based on Malachi, all right? So it's very clear, naughty. The sorcerers, the adulterers, the perjurers, unfair bosses, racial oppressors. I mean, these are all the people mentioned in the verses we just read. And then of course, the nice list, these are the faithful church-going folk, okay? These are the generous givers, the morally upright, people who are faithful to their spouses. Those are from the first two chapters of Malachi where those came from. And he's making it so clear. And, and the people are, are receiving this prophecy from Malachi and it makes intuitive sense to them. I think it makes intuitive sense to us. You're right, there, there is corruption within. And so we've got to kind of separate out the wheat from the chaff. We've got to have the, the naughty ones over here and we know who they are and the nice ones over here. And one day the Messiah is going to come and he's going to get rid of those naughty ones for us. And this was received as a pretty good and optimistic promise by people because of course, Everyone knows that we're on the nice list. It's, it's those people over there who are on the naughty list. They're the ones who are gonna get purified, not us. So they received this prophecy. They're really happy about this. This is great. When is this purifier gonna get here? And the answer is not for 400 years. 400 years, this promised purifier doesn't show up. A lot of other things happen. But the whole time, while other stuff's happening, while the wheels of history are moving, God is moving all the pieces and getting everything in place so that 400 years later, this Messiah will come as promised. And in fact, it'll come even the way Malachi described. If you, if you recall, verse one, Malachi says, before this one comes, before this Messiah comes, there's gonna be a messenger and he's gonna come first and he's gonna tell us all about the moment when the Lord himself, the anointed one, the Messiah, will be here. And so 400 years later, who steps up to the scene but John the Baptist, uh, who everyone recognized as a true prophet of God, someone who was a faithful messenger proclaiming God's word to the people. And this is what John the Baptist said. And, and notice if you, if you catch any similar language or themes that people who remembered Malachi's prophecy might have 
resonated with a little bit. This is what John says as part of his sermon and his prophecy. He says this, he says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me is gonna come one who is far more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. I'm just the messenger. And what's he gonna baptize you with? He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with refiner's fire. And his winnowing fork is in hand and he will clear the threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And the Israelites, God's people of that time, they, they heard this prophecy of John and they recognized immediately. There's, oh, this is the guy. This is the one we've been waiting for for 400 years with the refiner's fire. He's gonna come, he's gonna purify everything. He's gonna get rid of all those naughty folks. Can't wait to see. And they're looking around and saying, all right, where is he, John the Baptist? Who is this guy? And then one day Jesus of Nazareth shows up and John points at him and John says, that's him, that's the guy the guy that's gonna baptize with fire and the Holy Spirit. And the people started flocking to Jesus. And they, and they were so anticipatory, they were so grateful. He's finally here, this guy we've been waiting for, and now the purge is going to begin. And they were just watching and following around, being like, all right, Jesus, who are you gonna take out first? Who are you gonna burn first? Right? They're like, okay, well, we remember Malachi's list, don't we? All right, the adulterers. So uh, let's wait and watch. Let's, let's see Jesus take out those adulterers. Let's see him get them. And so they bring an adulterous woman to her and they hand Jesus the stone. They're like, stone her. And Jesus says, no, I, I forgive her instead. And they're confused and they're perplexed and they say, oh, okay, all right. I guess we'll leave the adulterous woman alone. All right, but the Romans, this oppressive, cruel government, you're here against oppressors, right? You're gonna purge and purify the oppressors. All right, you're gonna take out those Romans, right? And then a centurion Roman leader comes up to Jesus and Jesus does a miracle on his behalf. And they're confused and they're perplexed and saying, all right, if you're not gonna take out the adulterers, you're not gonna take out the oppressors, um, all right, uh, you know, maybe it's the cruel bosses, maybe it's the unjust uh, bosses and, and money makers. And like, oh, we've got corrupt tax collectors all over the place. And Jesus goes and he sees this guy Zacchaeus, this corrupt tax collector, and like, this is the time, he's gonna get and purge this guy. And then Jesus goes and has lunch with the tax collector. And now they don't know what to make. John promised us purging, refining fire. John promised us that you are gonna burn something up and you're just being nice to everybody. All the people that as near as we can tell, we read the scriptures very carefully, they are on the naughty list. And I think their first impulse matches mine. Because my first impulse when I hear these stories of Jesus, when I see Jesus' actions, is I think he must have forgot his naughty and nice list at home. Silly Jesus, if you're gonna come and refine people, then let's, let's start doing it. And since you forgot your list, I have a list all made up. So since you forgot your list, Jesus, let me just point you in the direction of the people who need purging, right? We've all got them, I've got one, here's mine. This is my list, all right? Okay, people who litter, I'm done with them. Nigerian spammers, anyone doesn't like dogs, right? Mark Zuckerberg, I mean, just for Facebook alone. Alone, he's on the naughty list, right? Right? And then on the nicest, we know who it is. It's me, my friends, the family members that I actually like, firefighters, Dolly Parton, who doesn't like Dolly? Right? It, some of these are no-brainers, Jesus. It should be pretty clear what's going on. And, and we try and bring him our list and say, are, are, are you forgetting this thing that you were supposed to do? There are some people on this list that they need to get purged. They need to get refined. And he doesn't. In fact, he gears up for this one big speech. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. It's one of his most famous speeches. And all of these people that are a little disappointed that, that he hasn't been, been purging who they expected him to purge, like they, they gather together in huge crowds for this speech. And saying, this is the moment. This is when he finally lays people out. And he's gonna, he's gonna just totally uh, go to town on all of, the, all of the oppressors, all of the sinners, all of the, all of the bad bosses. He's gonna take them all out. And they gather together and say, all right, Jesus, tell us who God hates. Tell us who God is going to refine for us. And instead of saying, God hates the oppressor, God hates the adulterer, God hates the, the, the racial oppressor, God, God hates the unfair boss, instead of saying any of those things, Jesus said, God blesses those who are poor in spirit. God blesses those who are meek. 
God, bless, God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice. God blesses those who are humble, who are merciful. God blesses those whose hearts have been purified. And it's like he's speaking a completely different language than anything they've known for hundreds of years. That this refiner, this purifier, he, he's not talking about purifying uh, all, these, all these external threats and evils. He's saying something far different. He's saying that, that I want your heart to be purified. Not those evil jerks around you. You, you yourself, I want your heart to be purified. That's the refining fire work that I'm doing. And people tried to roll it, they tried to understand it, but it really didn't, didn't work, especially for the religious leaders of the time. Because in fact, th th this, this dynamic happened where all of the people that were so clearly on the naughty list, people, uh, Jesus spoke to them with, with, with kindness and compassion and gentleness. And the only people he actually spoke to with any, anything re resembling harshness or, or meanness or, th or that refining fire that they'd expected was towards the religious leaders themselves, the, the Pharisees, who by anyone's measure were the holiest, most righteous, least sinful people on the planet. These were the good, faithful church folk. And these were the people that Jesus spoke to like this. He said, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside, they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside also will be clean. See, he keeps, even when he does have a rare, harsh statement, he's focused on this heart issue. He's focused on refining something that's internal, not something that's external. And it's easy to read this, this section here about the Pharisees and say, oh, okay, we, we get it. Uh, it's just that we had the naughty and nice list all wrong. We thought the Pharisees and the, and the religious leaders, we thought they were so clearly on the nice list, but now it turns out they're hypocrites, they belong on the naughty list too. But that's not actually what Jesus is saying. What he's saying is any application of this purifying fire, that this launderer's soap that, that, that projects it out into the world around you is a misapplication of this promise that God made for his Messiah. You see, ultimately, he would do something and he would do this purifying act in a way that nobody would expect or predict. See, here's the thing. If you look in the Old Testament, in the law of Moses, this is from Warren Wearsby, a theologian, all throughout, there are three ways, three ways that God provides to his people to cleanse and purify and make them acceptable to him. Three actions that you can do that will make you pure. Water is a means by which you can be washed clean in Old Testament law. Fire is a means by which you can be purified in Old Testament law. Those are two of the three, and you'll notice those are the two that are mentioned by Malachi, that he will be a refiner's fire, he will be a launderer's soap, he will wash and he will burn. There's a third way that God provides for people to be cleansed, and Malachi doesn't mention it. And maybe you know what it is. If it's not water, if it's not fire, it's blood. And Jesus, instead of purging all of the unmentionables, all the naughty people, he went to a cross and he spilled his blood for the sake of purifying his people. And in that moment where he's on the cross and he dies to fulfill this promise of God, Rome doesn't fall the moment he dies. When Jesus dies, all poverty isn't wiped out. All judges don't suddenly become fair. Jesus' death accomplished nothing externally obvious of purifying. It fixed nothing that you could see with your eyes, but what it did was in that moment, it purified your heart. It purified mine. This is the purifying work that Jesus does. 
This is how he fulfilled the promise of Malachi. Not by separating people out into naughty and nice lists, not, not by finally having a vendetta against whoever you think most is deserving of some sort of purging and retribution, but in this one act purifying my heart and yours and forevermore changing our standing and relationship with God. A few years later, one of Jesus' most influential early followers, a man named Paul, he was reflecting on this moment and he described the work of Jesus in a way that had not been described before. I take you to Paul's letter to the Corinthians. And as he's describing this purifying act of Jesus on the cross, he says this, he says, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. But each one should build on their own personal foundations with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ himself. And if anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day of judgment will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, that refiner's fire that we've been hearing so much about today. And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. And if what has been built survives, then the builder will receive a reward. But if it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. It's a very interesting and different picture of this refiner's fire and one that, that I don't think we, we have spent enough time wrestling with uh, as, a, as a body of believers. In, in fact, so much so, I, I wanna read it again. I want you to really pay attention to each sentence here in these five short verses of what Paul is describing the, the act of this refiner's fire. So let's read it one more time. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. And if what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. And if it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. I wanna leave this last verse up here for just a minute. I want you to notice the consequence of this refining fire that when Jesus comes in the second coming, when, when this day of judgment, when he comes back, if he refines you, and maybe you've done the worst job you could do, you built on the foundation of faith that Jesus Christ laid in your heart, you built on it with wood and straw and just the, the worst building materials imaginable, and it will get burned up in the fire, and what will be the consequence to you? You will still be saved you will still be saved. The refiner's fire is not something that's in designed to keep you who have been chosen, you who have been died for on the cross. It's not something that's it's designed to exclude you or reject you from the kingdom. Your salvation is assured because of the foundation of Jesus Christ that he laid. Not anything that you did or I did, nothing that we could lay or work hard enough or do a good enough job. He laid a foundation by conquering death on the cross. And that foundation cannot, will not burn up. His refiner, refiner's fire will not do away with that. And so there are a few lessons I want us to learn from this passage and from this, this prophecy of the refiner's fire in general. And so, so the first one is this, that purifying is not a rejection. When people first heard that prophecy of Malachi, when we read that prophecy today, it is so natural and easy to conclude that this refining fire, this launderer's soap, is a rejecting of some who are dirty or impure or unclean. It's saying, oh no, they're the nice people and they're in, they're good, and then to the rest that are dirty, they're rejected through the refiner's fire. They're burned up, they're destroyed. 
But in fact, this purifying is not a rejection because it only happens for you and for me after he already died for us and laid a foundation in our hearts. The intent, the idea behind purifying is not something God is trying to do to disqualify you or me. It's something he's trying to do that's ultimately for our own good and for the good of people around us. Which leads me to my second lesson from this is that purifying is always personal. And by that, I mean it's personal to you, personal to me. My natural tendency is to treat purifying as an external action, as something that God needs to do to those out there. He needs to purify them. He needs to purify that group. He needs to purify that sinner. He needs to purify all these things around me, and yet that is not the picture that Jesus paints. He says, my purifying is for you. Because God doesn't bless you by, by purifying and purging all of the evil around you. God, God blesses you by purifying your heart. And that's the action that he's taking and, and that's the promise he wants you to receive is that when he's purifying, it's not an act of rejection, it's not something against others, it's something that's, that's intended for you personally. It's an internal purification that's going on. And, and ultimately, if, there, if there's nothing else you get, if, if there's one line, I, I want it to be this one. That purifying means that you are the most valuable thing in the world. You don't purify dirt. You don't purify dung. You don't purify paper. You purify gold. You purify silver. And the fact that this promise of a Messiah is God saying that he wants to purify you and your heart, that that's not a harsh prophecy, that that's not a pain, that's not meant to be a painful promise. It's meant to show and convey the worth that you have to God. That he looks at you and he sees you as valuable as gold or silver and he says you are worth purifying because you have something inside you that is so great, that is so noble, that is so holy, that is in the image of God himself and you just can't see it. In the same way that gold in the ground, it doesn't shine because it's got all of these impurities, all of these specks, all of these, this dirt and these other rocks mixed in. But when you take that gold and you pull it out and it doesn't look like anything to start with, but then you refine it and you refine it and you refine it and now it glitters like nothing else in the world. And now its value is clear for all to see. If you've been feeling this purifying touch of God the way I have the last few months, as you've experienced the hardships and the difficulties that this year has brought like none other in living memory. It's so easy to feel like it's because you've done something wrong, because the world has gotten too broken. But know this too, that in this moment, just like when Jesus was walking the earth, God is using these difficulties, he's using these strains to purify you, to make you all the more valuable to help you shine in a world that needs darkness. There's nothing more valuable to God than you and that's why it is worth it to him to spend the time and to go through the heartache and the difficulty of helping purify your heart the way he did on the cross and the way he continues to do in your life and my life now. Now as a closing thought on that last concept, I think about a good friend of mine from a few years ago and she was a woman who wore her brokenness on her sleeve. You got to know her, you knew everything that was wrong with her. You, you knew her eating disorders, you knew her, her immorality, you knew all of her fears and her doubts because she didn't try to hide any of it. And when she came across this kind of a concept in, in the Bible, her, her reaction was primarily fear. Because she thought, what if all of these things, all of the things that make me broken, they're what make me me. And if I were to let God refine them, I wouldn't have an identity anymore. I wouldn't be me anymore. Maybe it'd be better, but it, it wouldn't feel like me. And if that's a fear that you share, it's one that I sometimes do, I, I, I wanna speak to you with a story uh, from one of the great modern Christian theologians, a man named C.S. Lewis. And he describes this human being, this, this man, who's on the threshold of heaven. And yet his, his particular sin, his lust, 
has wrapped itself around him in the form of a red lizard that sits on his shoulder and has its tail twined around his neck. And this man knows that he cannot take another step into heaven as long as this lust is weighing him down. And an angel has met him at the boundary. And the angel has said, I can kill it for you. I can kill that lizard. I can get rid of it. And then you can come in, you can have everything be the fullest person that God had for you. And, and, and this man, he, he, he waffles and he quivers. He's like, I, I want you to kill it, but I'm not sure it's gonna hurt. And, and there's so much fear. And, and ultimately, in agony, he gives the angel permission to kill this lizard. And the angel pulls his sword, he strikes the lizard dead, and it's painful. But the moment it's gone, the man suddenly fills in to himself. But that's not the most beautiful part. The most beautiful part is that this lizard that had defined him his entire life, this thing that had been a core part of his identity, as it lay there dead on the ground, the lizard was resurrected too. And the lizard came back to life, but this time it grew not into a lizard, but into a noble white stallion that the man now jumped on its back and it carried him into the heights of heaven to meet with his maker. You see, our hearts aren't the only things that get refined. The very things that, are, that we are afraid are the darkest, most unlovable, most disqualifying things about us. They get refined too. They themselves get purified. And God actually doesn't take away our personality or identity. He actually makes it transformed. He redeems it as well. See, this naughty nice list, it's not us versus some other people. This naughty nice list is about what's going on in our hearts. In fact, I want you to look at, at this one. So this is what's really going on with the naughty nice list. Is it saying all of these things in me, these things in my heart that need to be purified, they're not, they're not get, gotten rid of, they're not disqualified, they're not ignored. They're, they're redeemed and transformed into something better. That that anger that I feel that when it's redeemed, when it's purified, it doesn't go away. It gets transformed into my ability to advocate for justice for others. Or that shame that's holding me back. And again, I think maybe this is a part of who I am. It is a part of who I am, but the shame itself gets redeemed and it gets turned into compassion for all those who have the same shames and struggles that I did. Or even from that story, that the picture from C.S. Lewis, The Great Divorce, this idea that even my lust itself, the, the, the most depraved, shameful thing about myself, that it gets transformed into holy desires and passions that drive me forward towards God himself. This is the promised work of Jesus, that he will purify our hearts and purify even the things about us that we are afraid have to be done away with, that they're done something better. In fact, here's a closing quote from that book, The Great Divorce. Here's how C.S. Lewis describes it. He says, nothing about us, nothing, not even the best and the noblest parts of us can go on as it now is. And, but also, nothing, not even what is lowest and most bestial about us, will not be raised again if it submits to death. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. And what is a lizard compared with a stallion? Lust is a poor, weak, whimpering, whispering thing compared with that richness and energy of desire which will arise when lust itself has been killed. You and all the parts about you are so valuable that when Jesus wanted to fix the world, he didn't do it by trying to purge and pur purify all the things that were wrong externally. He came to purify and refine and make you the most valuable version of yourself. And as we look around with that, as, as, as easy as it is to look around with, with, with despair and fear and anger at what's going on around us, to feel like God has maybe forgotten his naughty and nice list at home and that he's laying down on the job of purging the world of all that needs to be purged. Remember this, that this coming Messiah that we will celebrate in two short weeks, he came to purify the world, but not, not in an in a out there kind of a way, in an in here kind of a way. And that the more we let that purifying fire burn the things out that need to be burned, the more we let that launderer so clean us and make us who we were meant to be, the more we bring hope and light into the world. 
the more we make change for justice and for all of the things that matter to us. They come the moment we stop trying to purge what's out there and the moment we freely invite God in to purify all the things that are holding us back. And it's in that promise that I find hope to get through the days as we count down to Christmas. Let's pray. Lord God, I am humbled and in awe that you see us as this most valuable treasure, hidden away deep in a mine, covered in muck and dirt and impure materials, and Lord, that you promised to come, to purify us, to help us shine the way you always intended us to. And so Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work in our hearts, that you would bring that refiner's fire. And Lord, knowing that it will be painful, but that it will also be glorious, that our lizards will be replaced with stallions and that the things that drag us down will be converted into the things that lift us up into your glorious goodness. So Lord, help us find joy in this season. Help us to receive your purifying work in our hearts. We pray this all in your name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Help us grow our community by liking this video, sharing it on social media, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and commenting below if you found this service helpful or inspiring. Also, don't forget to tune in to our Advent service coming to you this Wednesday at five o'clock. It's gonna be the last one of the year. It's gonna be awesome. Thank you again so much and blessings on your week.